Hello ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm well, very well welcome to our channel. It's called Conservite. It's a Bulgarian channel and we have been um, kindly invited by our hosts from Alternative for Germany to participate in one of their events. Yesterday we participated in a wonderful round table with Senator uh, Richard Black. Today we have with us uh, Professor Dr. Harl Weil. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Professor. You're very welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in Berlin and to be hosted by, uh, by your uh, fraction, by your fraction. Um, Professor Weil is, uh, is in the EU Foreign Affairs Committee, if I am not mistaken. And could you please just tell us a few words about yourself? Because you're in academia, which is quite a relatively comfortable job security mm. place. Mm. And to go from academia into um, a rather super intensive political life, that's quite a step. So it takes, it takes some tough decisions. How did you end up? in politics and in IFA. Okay. So before 20 years of academia, I've, I survived five years of uh, normal employment and within these five years, uh, three years of self-employment. So I survived five years of self-employment <laughs> before joining academia. And joining academia, starting with my master thesis or German way diploma arbeit at that time, mid, mid 80s, uh, I uh, was very interested in this European affairs, history, culture, and its economic uh, planning and consequences so mm. far. And what amazes, amazed me most when I did my master thesis, when I did my PhD thesis, to see all the critique which was launched uh, right from the start. In the 60s, 70s, you can hear more substantial and uh, open-minded critique of the whole thing than today, where there seems to be only one opinion allowed and that it's good and it will go be even better, even closer and ever, ever better. So, and uh, in these 20 years of academia, uh, I noticed a decline, a decline of standards and uh, concerning teaching, education and research and a decline uh, most significantly of uh, policy. No matter if it's policy in terms of education or directed towards education or uh, say the military, the foreign policy stuff and the domestic policy, first of all. There was no, no management of whatsoever. It was a letting go, letting things happen and mm. reacting only, reacting to the oil crisis of the 70s, mm. reacting of the military crisis of the 80s, reacting that way uh, to the changes of the 90s, which were not really exploited for a betterment of things. I've seen there, there was no, no compass, no real roadmap. It was just an acting and uh, enlargement mm. for the sake of enlargement without doing any substantial reform before. There was always discussion of reform, the need of reform, substantial reform, not only cosmetics, uh, and it never happened. The contrary happened. The old Kinderkrankheiten, so the, mm. the, <laughs> the sicknesses of the, of the childhood, they never grew out and they added, added and added problems and sickness and the vitality of it all faded away. We've seen it since the year 2000, the Lisbon strategy, so-called, uh, making Europe the most innovative uh, economic area of the world, most growth in workplaces, most growth in GDP and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And what was the end of it? Well, before before the uh, crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, 9 following, uh, it was the least growing economy. It was the least uh, area which could handle quality migration and the least able area to have any influence of any problem in the world, let it be right before your door <laughs> or far away countries. And all that what we've seen in Afghanistan, what we've seen in the Western Balkans, well, lessons not learned again and again. And so I, I joined policy as a sort of self-defense, yeah, because even uh, the academic life, we had this Bologna reform, we had mm. this payment reforms, we had this grammar reform, it all started with, and well, here we go, here we are. So to put it in other words, uh, Professor, you experienced um, 
from your perspective as an academic person um, that uh, you have the feeling that the direction and the intent of the big European project has changed with the years and from your perspective it has not changed in the way it should yes. go and develop and this was for you one of the triggers to say okay uh, I want to give my opinion on those changes and to make an echo that something is not happening the way it should be and this was for you the moment where you decided uh, effectively to join the politics in Germany and how uh, did you end up uh, currently in alternative for uh, Germany? Yeah, I started uh, with the free voters in 2009 with the European elections of 2009. Mm -hmm. And these free voters, they gained 10% of the seats in Bavaria. And they were a competitor of the CSU, the monopolistic <laughs> party, conservative party of Bavaria. And they tried to expand, to take, to participate in the European election and to get into the other 15 German countries, Länder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, uh, actually I could stick with my expertise. I had this uh, world market and European economy and European Union stuff uh, I, I dealt with for 20 years. And then I tried to put one thing or another into practice and do some, some uh, coaching towards these things. And the program is very, was very similar. It was substantial reforms uh, of the EU, and if it's not possible to try another approach within another juridical framework and with the same participants as far as they want to, to play, to learn, play by the rules and play by better rules. Mm -hmm. And then 2013, uh, the AFD came out of the uh, predecessing elections. There was, uh, there was an effort to, uh, to join or to do something together with the free voters uh, and it failed and so a new initiative, a new party had to be born and that was in 2013 and I joined uh, well before the elections, uh, the federal elections of 2013 changed from, I had to, because there was no merger, uh, uh, changed from Free Waters to uh, AFD, which was very, very similar in the pro program towards uh, EU general, in general, uh, migration, and this, well, connected with the EU, this euro currency, this joint currency, and the harmonization madness, to harmonize things which better should not be harmonized, and. Uh, seeing it all to, as a race to the bottom. Well, Professor, <clears throat> you said that you joined in 2013, you joined um, Alternative for Germany. Could you please tell our viewers, because from probably many of them, oh, what were these people, the AFD, Alternative for Germany? Alternative für Deutschland, so that's why we abbreviated AFD. So who are these guys in the AFD? Because if you open the mainstream media, the only thing we hear, oh, these are the neo-Nazis of Germany, mm. these are the neo-fascists, this is the extreme mm. right, the populist right. What mm. are you fighting for? Why, why is there such a stigma on your party first? Mm. And what is actually the alternative that you mm. fight for? And, and mm. how do you feel with all this criticism that mm. is constantly poured mm. on your organization? Yeah. When you look at the, the past decades, you see that every every new party or uh, movement which uh, said even before the 90s and before reunification that things like uh, migration which are managed managed <laughs> in the way they are lead to problems in domestic policy and abroad at the end it helps nobody it may sound or look good but it adds problems and enlarge the problems actually. Mm -hmm. And everybody who had this critique on the present policy and management or non-management of real existing problems was framed as uh, right-wing and racist and this framing got worse and worse. And before AFD it was the free waters. Well, my friends asked me, well, are you sure that there are not too much right-wing NS uh, Nazis? Uh, and before the, uh, besides the uh, free voters, uh, when you when you look up the the comedians and the the critique and the fun made out of conservative or liberal thoughts, it was only the FDP, formerly 
<laughs> liberal party mm. now acting as a sort of proxy as, as another left-wing party mm. but formerly liberal uh, they were framed that way yeah it's only a party they, uh, they they just for the it's just for the rich people mm. they don't like foreigners and it's all about uh, getting down, curbing down Texas, that's mm -hmm. the Texas. That was the FDP and then uh, free voters got framed, but they escaped because the AFD emerged as the new bully. Well, those are the ones, it's so nice. And these people, they say it's not so nice and they must be bad and don't listen to them because they are, they have a, a hidden agenda or an open agenda, which we utterly reject. When I actually approached and just, all, my only information was about uh, the mainstream media framing this person, oh, this person who said this and the other things. That always the same person, mm -hmm. always the same, half citations, etc. I said, well, I, I will look at it myself. I will see what's the program of these folks. Mm. Well, sounds good. And for me, even familiar, sounds good. And then I go to the information, so-called Stammtisch, <laughs> info, mm -hmm. info Stammtisch. Uh, I want not only to see what are they writing and speaking, but who is speaking. Mm -hmm. Are they, well, you, you have certain ideas how Nazi, real, real existing Nazis or so must look like. So, and they did not look like, they did not talk like, they did not write like, and they did not act like. It was on the contrary. Actually, we have, I think, the, the, the most, uh, the, the high, one of the highest or the highest level of internationality with our peoples. So we have this migration, many people with migration background, which have this background by themselves or by their partners, by their spouses, etc. Within cetera. AfD. Within yeah. AfD, yes, within AfD. And uh, I think it's more international than anything else. And when you look at the pictures, who is acting, who are the, the, uh, the caterers of the party, you see with the greens and the left, it's, it's all white, it's all German. And if, and if, uh, if it's not, then it's, well, foreigners who, who are uh, lefties like the Germans, but the right-wing parties, they are, uh, as I said, it's framed, but we actually are more international and openly, and we live this in our party, and our program says nothing else. We are not generally against migration. We are against importing problems mm. in, your homeland and not solving problems abroad. And there's a terrible connection with you. Very interesting point. I think it will be great if you can exactly explain a little bit more about the current agenda of the AFD in the German Bundestag. Uh, what are you fighting for? What is the genesis of the party and what you would like to change currently in the German domestic policy? Okay. So the, the, f the first big change would not be, well, we have to, to uh, create many, many new laws and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's all about uh, realizing and enforcing the rules and laws who are already there. We are living in a state where the law is overruled by the, by the facts or by, by the actions or non-actions of ministers or the chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, who said, well, we, it doesn't work with, uh, with the, uh, front, at the frontier. We cannot have any uh, frontier management, any border management, etc. And now I think these days this, uh, this G7 goes on in Elmauts. Mm -hmm. And for this purpose, perfect, almost perfect border controls are installed for a couple of days because <laughs> they want to be endangered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, the day after, it's, it's gone and uh, the inflow of illegal migrants, etc., comes in. There is, it's absolutely unlawful. So the unlawful management or non-management of migration, mm -hmm. which has to be stopped and can be stopped uh, legally in a very short time. You mean illegal migration? Of illegal mm -hmm. migration, yes. And uh, the currency thing, it's all about, the last decades are all about breaking the existing laws and treaties. Firstly, bending them well a little bit and then uh, you break it. And so even the, the national Kurds 
have nothing against it, and it's cer certainly not uh, the, the 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 Luxembourg Kurd for the European Union who has nothing against the breaking <laughs> the breaking of of its own laws, so to speak. You mean the European Court of Justice, just to clarify. The court, uh, exactly, US. yes, yes, uh, and and that's the trend. So the first thing is re-establishing the rule of law, and all levels, migration, currency, economics, and well, instead they try to impose new laws, well, let's forbid, let's forbid uh, the uh, mobility as we know it, and let's enforce e-mobility, not by the market decision, not by science, but by law. So the law gets misused, new laws get introduced, and old laws and treaties are forgotten or twisted besides and uh, well over to be ever recognized. So it's all against its purpose. And that's the big difference between what's written and what was practiced before and what is practiced now in many, many areas for decades. And there is no consciousness about this. And actually it's a psycho psychological treat that, well, you get used to. You get used to, well, one, two, three days uh, Unnormal things, unnormality turn into normality. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the psyche of the of the thirties worked when you see well there is some law but there is some new law now and there is a power which is forcing it upon us and so I rather join them. Mm. Yes. Correct uh, me if I'm wrong and I'm mistaken, but uh, um, AfD is now for the second uh, legislative period in the Bundestag. Right. Right. Exactly. How do you feel, um, is the, the other parties feel about uh, uh, AfD and this yeah. agenda of re-establishing the rule of law, which is very interesting yeah. indeed. Uh, do they see it similar way? Yeah. Do you have any progress in convincing yeah. also the other uh, parties that this is a necessary agenda? Well, actually the, the business plan and the agenda of the other parties is taking advantage taking advantage of the existing uh, laws, of the non-enforced laws, and taking advantage of breaking the laws so they are on the side uh, that profits from it. Actually, we, are, we were the biggest opposition party in the last terms with 12.6% and, well, in the second term it's 105 mm -hmm. uh, We might be not the biggest nominally, the biggest opposition party, but you are the only one in terms of the content. Mm -hmm. So you can say they are all, all other five or six parties, they are against us. They are all in against us. I, I compare it with the competition on uh, the financial market, so to speak, where I spent uh, half a decade before entering academic life. <laughs> Uh, financial, so I was in the financial services thing, and when you look at insurance, for instance, you have more than 100 companies in, in, in all fields covering most or all fields of insurance, and uh, now comes a new company uh, which says, well, the, the half of the contracts you have, they are superfluous and bad. You don't need the contracts our non-bodies were selling you for decades or centuries. You only need half of those useless contracts yeah? and those contracts you need you can buy for the half price and that's us mm -hmm. and so it's quite understandably that hundred uh, competitors join and prevent a new company uh, which has better products <laughs> uh, to enter the market at all and so we are cut off from funding wherever they can manage it we have a foundation, all other parties, they have foundations which uh, raise their income from uh, 2 million digit, digits, I think 40, 40, 50, 60 million to hundreds, I think it's about four, 500 uh, millions today in the era of Chancellor Merkel. And they are a party besides the party. Mm. They are, have offices abroad, they are influencing foreign policy, etc. And it's a lot of money, it's all taxpayers' money and we are cut off from this funding. Not very legally, I suppose. Yeah? And the same comes when it comes to the vice speaker of the house, where we are denied the right of a house, uh, the vice speaker of the house, which all parties have and had before we are cut off, stripped off. You don't have any vice speaker? No, no, no. 
Are you not obliged to have? Each party should have a vice speaker. Yeah, Apparently. should and could. Uh, what what did I say about laws and mm -hmm. and rules and especially about not the clear written rules? Uh, they take it and twist it to their advantage and to keep us away from these positions. Even the chairs of committees. We had four committees, and that's in the last period, in the last election periods, we could actually man four seats, the four seats, uh, because uh, they played by the rules then, mm. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more by the rules than today. And in this period, we have uh, three seats of communists, two, three chairs, and we are denied all of them. So that's, that's the all new the norm. Grounds? On the grounds, well, it's not exactly written, and we interpre interpret what's what's written or not written in the way that you are not. Uh, well, person, you can, of your 80, we are, we are 80 uh, members of the party of the fraction. Well, whoever whoever you are proposing, it's uh, not acceptable. So you can be a professor, you can have. 20 years of work experience, you might have paid hundreds of thousands of. Uh, of t your own taxpayer, <laughs> euros, etc. But uh, they prefer people who broke up their studies and well, uh, mm. had only a political career only, and yeah. are perhaps young of age. And nobody cares. I assume in this uh, working environment, it's also very difficult for you to pass any laws, resolutions, uh, proposals to move on. I, 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 right. Are you successful in this? Right. Uh, they are they are denied, but mm -hmm. uh, depending the subject matter, uh, sometimes reality forces them to act at least nominally. Well, they may introduce this or that, but it's not enforced, not at the borders, not at the European uh, Central Bank, not anywhere. But they are forced to to address the problems we named before, mm -hmm. and we were the first who named before in most cases. Yeah. So, uh, you, of course, you have legislative initiative. You have the right to it, and it's a right. constitution. That's Every political party yes. has the right to legislative initiative. Right. How do your laws, what kind of life do they live? When you s propose a law on a, your yes. legislative initiative, yeah. what end do, they, do your laws make? How do they get perceived? What is uh, They get uh, rejected, mm. and it's not, there's really no, uh, no reporting about it. So the mass media, the quality media, the mainstream media, not only the state media, but also the private media, uh, is, uh, is shadow ban banning us. That means whatever is our initiative and however it's visible, well, what the party, the ruling party or another party is proposing now goes into that direction or is more or less the same the other party. Uh, proposed one year ago or some months ago. So when we introduce things, they, there's not a report, no report on it. The only thing which, which they seek to report or to create and to, to enforce uh, and to enlarge is personal scandals, which are not really not, uh, when, you, when you look at it, much, mostly much, much less uh, clear than what is with the other uh, parties. For instance, the mask business. There was a big scandal of the then ruling party and now opposition party, CDU, which had several members in, in Bavaria and, uh, and outside of Bavaria who did contracts and had received kickbacks in the six, mm. six digits, hundreds of thousands they made. So well, it's a problem. It doesn't look good, and we have to act. And we'll, well, this may st may step back or get out of the party. This person of the CDU mm. uh, was more than one person, but in the juridical process, yeah, the prosecution was well. It was not actually against the law. It was not that mm. explicit. The law was not explicit. So, uh, so the crime is not explicit and not there. And well, who cares? So, <laughs> and that's our real scandals. And uh, they are in a, in, a, in a quality and in a quantity which our so-called scandals uh, do not reach. So they are looking at every, every, every small spot on our West, but uh, the totally big spots, etc., they get forgotten immediately. And the only reporting which is done about us is not 
the reporting in our favor, but to enforce and prolong this framing and well, mostly it's the same scandals of, about the same people. Well, the, this person said this and that two years ago or five years ago or even ten years ago before the party existed and that's, you know, whatever these people say or propose, written or oral, it's, you know, of whom it comes from, those are all. Um, dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can continue the second part of our video because uh, I think it was a good introduction to first okay. talk about uh, AFD internally, some internal German politics as well, about yourself, about the party. And in the second part, we'll continue with a little bit more of international politics, geopolitics. It's quite an intensive uh, uh, arena right now, the geopolitics. So I think it will be interesting for our viewers to hear the second part with more international bit. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome again to our second part of the conversation. In the first part of our uh, talk with Professor Weil, we discussed internal German politics. But now, uh, let's turn to the international arena. Uh, there is a new geopolitical reality unfolding as we speak. We don't have to discuss uh, long about the war going on in, in Ukraine right now, uh, the sanctions that Europe imposed, uh, six or seven rounds of unheard of sanctions, and Germany being on the forefront of this, actually. Um, how does it affect the German economy? What is, um, for example, the Nord Stream 2? It's 99.9% .9 finished. I think it's technically finalized. It's all about legislative and, and uh, juridical finalization process, but it got completely stopped. Um, we know that you impose sanctions, you plural, the you in the EU, led by the German effort, of course, and the EU as well. Uh, we, we as the EU impose sanctions on Russia, very many. And But the German economy needs Russia inevitably, be it good or bad. How does this, how do you see the new political reality unfolding? How will it affect the German economy? And what do you see coming up next? Well, it uh, influences the economy uh, in a terrible way. But uh, firstly, we have to, to state that uh, it's also mi misused as a pretext. It's Putin and Putin's war, which makes energy and fuel, etc., so expensive. Well, this development started before, and it's due to German policy concerning energy and fuel. Uh, this uh, alternative energies who can't provide the energy which is needed, which forces you back on coal, oil, gas, etc., and which creates, uh, creates, created the problem well in advance for decades. And the other thing, as, as you said, it's unprecedented uh, sanctions. It's actually, I would call it, it's economic war. There is an announced economic world war going on, which was not going on in that way uh, in the first and second, uh, whether in these world wars or uh, in the time after these world wars. And that's a, a big experiment, and I think it's a big misjudgment of things in this. Uh, when you impose sanctions, which hurt hurts you more <laughs> than the country or people uh, you want to address with this, then it's a clear thing which became, becomes more and more visible, let's say, day by day. And I actually see the return. We have more sanctions. We have actually uh, announced uh, economic world war, uh, which, uh, which tells us that the, the Cold War never, never was over, more or less. So, uh, and this may lead to another thing we've seen in the Cold War, that, uh, well, Russia and China, the Sino-Soviet complex, it was called at that time, that was one uh, point of gravity, of gravitation, and there was a block-free world announced in Indonesia in 1955, Suharto, Suharto uh, in Indonesia, Bandung, Conference of Bandung, and that was uh, the, the birth of the free, the block free movement, which com was composed mainly of small and big developing countries, which were most of which were colonies back then in the 50s and 60s. And so this decolonization. The non aligned idea, movement. The non aligned, know. right. This uh, decolonization, non aligned movement. Uh, 
re-emerges, in my opinion, and it's a, a much different economic uh, position. The G7 countries, where they threw out the Russians 2014 after they joined in a few years before, they turned G8 to G7. Uh, they, it was half or more than half of the world's GDP. Yeah. So and no, the G7 uh, in our world of today, the 2020s, it's uh, well some 40, well, well under, much under 50 percent. So the leverage you have is quite a different one. The, the leverage uh, is on the side of your opponent, more or less. The non-alliance of yesterday are the non-alliance of today. And, uh, well, sort of uh, the Chinese and Russian economically sort of joined that. And that was uh, pre-visible and uh, it's realizing in front of our eyes and we see that the numbers, you can get nervous, you see the numbers, but it has to be translated into material effect when there is no more gas at the sta gas station, mm -hmm. when there is no more food in the supermarket, etc. Yeah. As long as it, it concerns luxury items, uh, okay, no problem, <laughs> or only the problem of a few people, but as it uh, is the basic needs, then, then the problem starts. Curious what you say. So obviously the, uh, the absolutely inflated prices of energy right now, they certainly affect the German economy, they certainly affect the German uh, consumer. But what you said is that, of course, the war exacerbated those processes. It made them uh, worse. And, and, but you said it had already started, this, uh, this energy crisis, this pr uh, price inflation, etc. So do you see this uh, as a structural problem that the Russian, so what I heard is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if that's a structural problem already existing within the German economy that only got worse with the war. Is this correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. All this uh, alternative energy stuff, this renewable stuff is not really working. There is no, not enough, uh, the, the basis is not big enough and technically it is not possible to create a constant flow, constant and big enough to uh, overcome uh, the time when there's no sun shining and no wind blowing. It's as simple as that. So you, you artificially build another net with this renewable energies, which is not stable and it doesn't matter if it consists of 33,333 mm. <laughs> uh, windmills, wind turbines, or the double of it. Mm. Yeah. In fact, uh, fr uh, news from the latest days, from the last days, is that uh, Germany will reopen some of their coal mines. Yes. And um, considering the fact that also Germany decided to go a path of shutdowning the nuclear power plants, yes. and I think in the end of this year the last, last three power plants in Germany yes. have to be plugged out, um, given the fact that obviously we are not still there to be able to secure energy from alternative fuels, given the fact that we will have probably in Europe gas issues with delivery and the supplier of gas. Uh, how do you expect that Germany will be able to sustain its role as the engine, the economic power engine uh, in Europe and in the mm. world? Or we will face uh, in Germany and in Europe, of course, uh, a uh, phase of stagnation and uh, financial uh, crisis. The German economic and industrial base is already eroded. Those high energy prices of the past led to a disadvantage for the German economy and industry, which is sort of compensated by, by the EU thing. So when it's too expensive, when work is too expensive here and energy is too expensive here, you can move to Czech Republic or mm -hmm. Bulgaria, <laughs> mm -hmm. Romania, etc. Yeah, and that takes place with all it is connected with, with a sort of a brain drain, with a sort of uh, unemployment rising in the country which enforces the high prices on, on work and, and uh, on energy, what we are talking about right now. And on the other side, uh, the neighbors, German neighbors can 
at one side they must suffer from German, say, uh, indolence or stupidity concerning the, the, the border management, for instance. So if Germany has a giant intake from all over the world and after they are in Germany, they go somewhere else yeah, <laughs> and producing whatever problems or solving it. <laughs> Uh, and on the other side, they, the German neighbors profit from it because uh, the old French and Belgium and Polish Nokia plants, they are very kind uh, and friendly to deliver <laughs> the energy Germany refused to produce itself in a more safer and modern way and to a good price, a price among friends, I suppose. And on the other side, also, so, so Germany has to pay uh, for the imported energy mm -hmm. and it has to be uh, has to pay for the exporter too because when when the sun is shining as it is today when the wind is blowing from time to time as it blows uh, then you have excess energy which is, is destroying your net and then you have to ask your neighbors well please take our energy our net will break down and then okay we can manage we take this and that and uh, for a good price mm -hmm. a price among friends <laughs> <laughs> Being a non-expert myself, what you say sounds suicidal economically. <laughs> that's that's it, right. It, it does, because the German industrial base yes. is, used to be, and still is quite a monster. It's, yeah. it's a, a, as Senator Black put it yesterday, it's a very muscular industrial economy, yes, which yes. it still is, Germany. Yes. And is it not just logical? It's yeah. evident to the non-expert yeah. me, and is yeah. it not logical to people who are in power, whose yes. only job description is to think of the future right. of Germany? Right. Okay, let's, let's make the most basic and natural calculation. We have a colossal industrial base that needs colossal energy. How should we solve, uh, solve that? So it doesn't look intuitive to me that Germany has taken this suicidal mm. course. Mm. And where will it lead? Mm. It's actually uh, a, pa a pathology. I would say it's a pathology starting in the culture, in the socio-cultural uh, complexity of uh, everlasting presence of the past, as one <laughs> weekly magazine posted. And uh, which is, a, by, by the way, a, a good joke because all this, this wind cr uh, craft thing was uh, exactly uh, tried. I, it was an Englishman who, who found out, an English journalist, um, just forgot the name, Dellingpole, James Dellingpole, great, great uh, blogger and, 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 and radio guy. In, uh, well, that in the, the German occupation of Ukraine after 41, mm -hmm. there was the big idea to, to get all the energy from windmills. And there were giant constructions from wood. And so it's, it's, it sounds so bizarre. But mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I don't think that anybody is very much aware of it. But you can, you can read it up. You can look it up yeah, at the magazines of that time. But now it's all about saving the planet. It's, it's a substitute for religion. The climate discussion, which started decades ago, and it led to a state of mind where you only concentrate on one thing, one goal. You say, well, this carbon, carbon is the, the killer problem, and uh, then you sort of commit suicide, economic suicide, because of you are afraid to die. Yeah, and that has nothing to do with enlightenment. That has nothing to do with with science and w with a holistic view on things. It's just driven by lobbies, by communication, by, by hysteria, which, well, the, would, and, and the structures who profit from this very hysteria, who make their money, whatever the outcome is at the end. And they're powerful structures. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, Professor Weil, let's uh, move on uh, to one very interesting topic also for our viewers. Um, currently, um, there are ongoing discussions uh, in uh, the European Union of the enlargement of the European Union to have new um, countries that mm. will join the Union from West Balkans, North Macedonia, uh, Albania. Um, speaking now from the latest days also uh, about Ukraine probably as a candidate state, uh, Moldova as well. Um, you told us that currently you are participating in a commission uh, in the EU foreign affairs uh, within the Bu uh, Bundestag. Could you uh, give us your view of those processes? Uh, are they reasonable? Uh, where are we going with those processes and uh, what to expect from those discussions? Well, 
they are not as reasonable as they may seem for the first sight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, they are partially uh, futuristic and utopistic and partially anachronistic at the same time. When you s look at the, well, say, uh, natural, nat natural evolution of European affairs and cooperation, you see it started with the big countries, it started with France and Germany and uh, Italy joined. Uh, and besides of that, and even before that, there was, uh, I think it's quite comparable to the situation now with the West Balkan countries, the small West, West European countries, uh, Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, mm -hmm. right after the First World War, they created a customs union, mm -hmm. sort of customs union, and uh, ever since they, uh, they had a sort of union in an economic way and juridical way and the movement of capital and people was no problem. There were small countries, the structure was not that uh, different, they were quite, not really homogeneous, but quite comparable and they had an integration process themselves. And those three countries joined, the three small countries which constituted a middle country in terms of population and growth, they joined this two or three partner approach mm -hmm. when it was uh, EU6. And then the enlargement came, EU9, 12, and I81, Greece joined, 86, Portugal and Spain joined, and then the big enlargement when even Austria and, and uh, Mediterranean small countries joined and the Eastern uh, enlargement. So I think it's quite uh, interesting and uh, it shows that there are alternatives. I think the Western Balkan Customs Union, which was discussed and practiced in some part, I think there is a transport union right now, which is already and practically and materially realized and has, has and makes sense and enhances the uh, possibility of and for uh, economic interaction and growth of GDP, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's for its own sake. I think the development which can be done between more or less comparable or homogeneous countries can go much faster than when you combine it with uh, bigger countries which have a different structure, which force their productivity on you, which force you to raise prices for food, which force you to get rid of this small and medium-sized structure in agriculture, in trade and in industry too, which force the big scale economies and players on you. And that's inevitable. So, and, and on the other side you can say, well, I see there is a certain disadvantage and structural breaks. I throw a lot of money in special funding, social projects uh, and to compensate that. But it actually never worked. It created a social sector funded and, and heavily subsidized without any end in sight, permanent and growing subsidi subsi subsidies for the social, uh, economic and social cultural problems. Uh, and the industry is going down, down, down. First, your agriculture goes down because the productivity difference. Uh, second, the small merchants go down because the nice supermarket of whoever French or German comes along and your industrial structures, you hope, well, there's um, some uh, automotive industry coming in or we are even able to build cars when a foreign investor invests in a car factory or even components, well, that's nice. That is done even in, in uh, Macedonia, yeah, North Macedonia, it is done. There are quite a few German and Austrian automotive equipment deliverers. It was even in Ukraine the case. But now comes along, well, European means, means uh, European Union, that's climate, uh, and, and world, uh, saving the world and the climate. <laughs> and that means get rid of your automotive stuff, it's all electric now. Mm -hmm. So build electric cars or batteries with which economic and uh, environmental problems whatever, <laughs> but there's a new deal and you are, forced, you are forced to destroy your own structures, yeah? starting from agriculture and it ends up or it starts with the educational uh, sector. It's a nice thing to travel abroad. It's a nice thing to spend time abroad and not being forced for that purpose to wear a uniform and join 
They go to other countries with arms, that's a very nice thing. And you come back with the ideas you've seen, you come back with the realities you see. Perhaps after a big, the big hype, uh, new countries, very, very interesting. There is some backlash, you see the problems. You not only see the sunny sides, you see some problems. And when these problems turn out to be your, or to become your problems, you, you think twice or three times. So and at the end, where's the balance between advantage and disadvantage, dangers and chances? And it's quite a mixed picture, and the way it's done right now, uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible uh, thing, because the substantial reform was, did never happen, no matter if small or big, if one or more than one country is joined, the problems, they got more or less fixed, yeah? <laughs> cemented, and more and more money is thrown upon it, and that leads to the to the fact that not problem solving is your business plan, but uh, letting the problems go on. Speaking of one big problem, at least from our B Bulgarian perspective, is and in the, in the context of EU enlargement, is of course North Macedonia. You may be aware, or maybe not, but uh, Bulgaria has imposed a veto on the starting of the EU accession talks and <laughs> negotiations between North Macedonia and uh, and the European Union. France has taken on an initiative on, because France right now, you know, has the, uh, is hosting the, the Council of the European Union. And there is a Macron initiative, please remove your veto and we promise that we will be a guarantor for A, B, C, D. Uh, do you see Germany joining this initiative and what is, um, because for, at least for us in Bulgaria, that's an extremely sensitive topic. Uh, and there is, I would even say, a majority, um, uh, a consensus, a societal consensus about this about this issue. Is Germany likely to join this effort? And, and what is Germany's view on, 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 on this? I don't know if, I mean, the EU Foreign Affairs Committee, of course, you might have heard of, you probably have well heard of this issue. Hmm. Well, uh, it's very likely that, that Germany sooner or later does what others, and especially France, expect him to do. Why this or, or, mm. or not to do. Uh, well, it comes to to the hard selling argument. You want to achieve this and that with the accession of one country, and you are uh, like on the phone trying to sell financial products or so. You have to buy now because tomorrow the offer is off. <laughs> And that shows that it's not that serious as it seems at the first sight. So it's a diplomatic uh, affair. And uh, uh, besides that, it's, uh, you can, you can uh, characterize the EU and its predecessors as a, a thing where only happens what France wants and only when France it was. But some there's a problem with the time, you have to wait a little bit, a second approach or a third, but at the end it happens what France wants. And that's not generally bad, we've seen it with this uh, tax, taxonomy and the introduction of uh, nuclear power, it's green power, mm. <laughs> it's carbon free, <laughs> so take it. And the German Greens and uh, all Germans, all six green German parties except IFD, <laughs> had to accept it. Yeah, not fond of it, but had to accept it. And the same might happen with these approaches where this is actually uh, quite the opposite what uh, Monsieur Macron uh, proposes in the terms of Ukraine and the other West Balkan states. That means there's possibility of two, no, there's not only one union, there's two unions and two paces Things can happen and we can do it only uh, gradually and uh, concerning some fields of uh, some branches of industry, of uh, foreign policy, etc. There's, uh, there's a joint effort possible, but not the general, the general accession as a full member as, as, as he opposes with Turkey. Yeah? And this, the North Macedonia thing, it's, uh, it's a contradiction to that. And well, maybe he will make up his mind or things will turn away that it makes no sense or I don't know. 
it, it's curious that there is such an extreme urgency on this. You must remove the veto yes. right here and now, exactly yeah. like you say. Uh, by this or tomorrow, the offer is off. It, it's, um, as you said, it's rather contradiction. Not to mention that accession yes. process with Turkey started in 1960, 62, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think it's the 59th year. We are exactly. it's heading so towards 60th uh, anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you could say, well, it's not a big problem. Well, let's let's put them on hold, and uh, problems will disappear if you don't deal with it. So, conscious about the time, probably one last question because it's an important one also uh, for our viewers. And uh, given the fact that in uh, Bulgaria there are, let's say, discussions on the on our candidate status for the eurozone, um, it's uh, now under discussion if mm. Bulgaria in one or two, three years uh, uh, will be part of the Eurozone and uh, to yeah, effectively be, uh, take the Euro as mm. the, the currency uh, that uh, is applicable in Bulgaria. Um, I know that, of course, Germany has done this uh, uh, 20, uh, two, three years ago. From your perspective, uh, as a, a, a politician and as German citizen, w what 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 is your view? Should we take this step uh, and be part of the famous club of the rich one, or uh, is this not the right moment at all? Uh, how is your view on this? Yes. Well, you see that it uh, creates uh, the joint currency creates many problems already for more or less all existing countries, mm -hmm. all, all co member countries of it, where at one side there's uh, profiting from it, you get access to credit and you are not enforced, not forced to enforce any, any structural reforms. And, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, that's for the long-term development bad when it's all about credit and not about restructuring or uh, evolution, evolution of economic uh, system in one country. And uh, I think you should look very, very closely on the positive effects of non-membership in the Eurozone when you see how it works in Poland, yeah, which has, a, I think, one of the biggest, uh, the, the biggest uh, growth rates of GDP. And the, when you, um, you see the infrastructure which was built up, and the Scandinavian countries, which are non-Euro member countries. So you see the, the sovereignty they have, you see the productivity, which is connected with this question, and their advantages in foreign trade within the European Union and, without, and with uh, the trade with third countries. Yeah? Uh, look very closely on these examples and don't get impressed uh, or depressed while well, there's the nice Eurozone world where things are even better than in the rest of the European Union. There is much more uh, empirical evidence and examples does it, that also this uh, side of the European affairs uh, has more, more uh, disadvantages than advantages. Yeah, because in Bulgaria, for example, there is not even a, a real debate. Some uh, smaller uh, media channels like ours, of course, we discussed. We had a, a wonderful guest on our, uh, on our show about three or four months ago who explained wonderfully well his, uh, uh, how we should not join, why we should not join, etc. But with these little exceptions, there is uh, almost no debate in our country, which is rather mm -hmm. weird. Our yes. country is almost not, it's like, it's imp it looks like, yet again, urgency. Mm. It's imposed on us, nobody's asking us, mm. nobody's going to speak about yes. referendum, and, and, and that's, yeah. that's, notable. that's yes. notable. There is no debate. Again, imposed, take it now, do it here right. and now. Why? Right. Why, why this rush? Yeah. I have no clue. I think the mainstream media is uh, in for the money, and it executes the things the government and the, the masses want. Uh, cheap credit, it's about gifts, it's not about hard work, etc. Mm. And that's, that's the psychology of a bad trade and a hard sell on the telephone. Reject it, please. <laughs> Professor, uh, I can only say one uh, great big thank you for your time today. Uh, thanks to the organization for uh, providing us this, the infrastructure for this interview. Thank you, Dobri, as well, for. Um, for this uh, wonderful time. Uh, to our viewers, thank you so much for your attention, for seeing this. Of course, it, uh, our conversation went quite a bit around Germany. We are in Germany, we are invited in Germany, but 
it, it's only natural because Germany is the motor, the engine of the EU, so what happens in Berlin really matters a lot. Uh, well, Professor, you said yesterday something interesting that they say France, Germany are the leaders of the EU and it's like a tandem bike where France is only cycling a lot on the back seat and, mm -hmm. and somebody else is ruling. But that's a whole other topic altogether. Germany is Germany, France, France, oh, Germany is on the back seat constantly uh, yes. pedaling. Anyway, thank you so much yet again. And um, thank you very much. thanks to the viewers for their time and attention. And we hope to be here again. Great. Thank you too. And I congratulate uh, Bulgaria that it has such nice young professionals mm -hmm which have an enlightened approach on things, even here in the EU and Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you very much. much.